you're watching or listening to Strangers in Space. And for the next half an hour, we're going to be talking about this week's news, so you don't have to. Hi, I'm JR. Hi, I'm Matt. Hi, I'm John. So our monthly news review took a couple of months off because there was no news, and now it's gone weekly because there's so much news. Oh, oh. Or they're letting out what news there is in fits and starts. But finally, we've had the episode titles and a full list of writers and directors. And so I guess that's going to be our conversation this week. And I'm going to say it now before we even get into this. This conversation is going to involve involve spoilers. So more spoilers than what is necessarily in the public eye. Although it's not going to be massively spoilerific, because I don't know if any of us goes deep diving looking for spoilers. I don't, but I'm in a couple of places where a certain amount of spoiler stuff will cross my desk, as it were. And so I I, it B- BDSM clubs in Croydon that he goes to on a, <laughs> not Croydon, on a Saturday night. Topsham. <laughs> well, those ones you frequented when you were down there, Matt. Yeah, yeah. I've I've only been once to Croydon. Don't forget, I used to be his postman, so I've seen the detritus. Ah. It would be silly to have this conversation without talking about what little spoilers we know of these episodes, because then we'd basically just be given a list and saying, oh, that's a nice few words. Oh, that few words is rubbish. There will be a bit of that's a nice few words and that few words is rubbish. I guess what I propose to do is just go through them one by one and we'll talk about the title, the writer, the director, whatever. Say what we know about it. The writer. (laughs) (laughs) Say what we know about it, say what we think about it and tie it in with overall thoughts that we've got. Do you want to do an overall thought before we get into it? which kind of goes along the lines of what we were saying last time on the last time one we talked about the trailer that disney put out and now of course we've got a sort of bbc version of the trailer too which is a bit rubbish no david bowie in it right it's like can't can't get the clearance money i don't know bbc are cleared to use anything they want really aren't they yeah they've used plenty of pop music in doctor who and trailers and whatnot before so i don't don't think it's that i think it's just that the disney people said right give us some footage and paid somebody to make the trailer whereas the bbc people probably just got their trailer people to make the trailer i don't know it's also trailers haven't they for a long time bbc They, they did the first couple of years and then it's been out of house but yeah, whatever. But the don't BBC really one, so. I don't think, is quite as finessed as the Disney one was. No. And it's and it's got new stuff in it, but it's essentially the same sort of thing, really. It's that two-minute pre-series trailer. But what we talked about last week, or what I talked about, what I suggested, it was just was it just you and me, Matt, last time, wasn't it? Probably. Yes, yes. It yes. Was. So it'd be interesting to get John's thoughts on this. I talked about the fact that it looks like they seem to be playing up on the fact that there might be a sound of thunder element, butterfly effect element to this, where there might be an overarching storyline about how time gets changed. If you go back in time. (laughs) Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, I was going to bring that up a little bit later on. But yeah. (laughs) But okay, then let's do that now. We'll get into the we'll get into the titles and that afterwards. Okay, so it looks like time is being shifted in some way. So there's a couple of episodes where there's actual time paradoxes, where there's actually going back in time and changing things and then sorting it out before the end of the episode. So the church on Ruby Road was one and it looks like the devil's cord is somehow doing that kind of thing too. In fact, in the trailer for it this time, it looks like the doctor's singing a song. So it might be a case of the Beatles get taken out of history and somehow the Doctor has to repair what happens when that happens. That sort of thing. We don't. It can't yeah. be worse than the other job they've done with that premise. <laughs> uh, yesterday or only yesterday. Yesterday, or whatever. Yeah. Yes, yesterday. yeah. yeah. Hmm. Maybe so. It looks like it's something along those lines. My point being, there's a lot in both of those trailers that kind of looks like Sound of Thunder type material it can't all be just from that one episode plus of course we've got this whole cyclical 
church on ruby road road thing church where they you've got the baby being deposited at the church doors and how does that all fit in with a storyline that's going to be an arc a series long arc essentially so you've got the whole who is ruby sunday and where does she come from it's clara all over again isn't it but anyway the point being if the ruby sunday thing goes together with the sound of thunder thing in some way then yes it looks like either somebody or something is meddling with time or the doctor has accidentally meddled with time himself and there's more on that should we do that now and then get into the okay Mm -hmm. So one of the things I meant to bring up last week and we just ended up talking about so much other stuff for so long. Then by the time we got to the end of the episode, it completely sort of slipped my mind is all the Susan Twist stuff. Mm. So going back to the cold open on Wild Blue Yonder, one of the actors in that little sequence with, um, I was going to say Einstein, it's um, Isaac Newton. Newton. Isaac Newton, Christ. One of the characters in that Professor N. <laughs> is played by Susan Twist, who also turns up in the church on Ruby Road in the sequence in the bar where the band is playing that Ruby's in. And one of the characters in the audience shouts out, give it some welly, play Gordette, which do you know the Steel Ice Band song? I know it, but I don't know the lyrics well enough. Well, the lyrics are all in Latin. I think kind of the point is, it's this medi. I think it's medieval or something yeah. like that. It, it's a music school, that, folky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Steel Ice Band's folk version of a medieval tune or something. I think. Anyway, point being, I think Play Gordette then becomes a hint to the audience that this character's been around for hundreds of years or something. If you tie it together with the same actor making the appearance in the cold open with Isaac Newton or Einstein, if you can't remember which one's which. And she's been seen, I believe, on set a couple times more, giving the impression that somehow after the Isaac Newton thing, she's following, watching over, not stalking is probably not the right word, but keeping an eye on the progress of Ruby Sunday, hence being at the concert where Ruby Sunday's playing. And so one of the theories is that she could be the meddling monk um dylan brought this up in our thread because a few people apparently had said to him is it true the meddling monk's going to be in this series and that is one of the theories which would have some weight and we talked about the idea of the meddling monk last time and we will be doing again in the future in an episode that still hasn't gone out because we've had so much other stuff on our feed since we recorded it but the other thing is they're old and we know so this could probably be the word, the sentence, the expression for the series, a bit like Bad Wolf, a bit like Torchwood, a bit like Harold Saxon. It looks like Russell T Davis is doing that again. And this time the word is triad or triads or S triad or Sue triad. In other words, the character that Susan Twist is playing might be called Sue triad or in other words, S triad, thus being an anagram for TARDIS. So the other suggestion is, well, if it's not the meddling monk, then surely it is A or the TARDIS, either malfunctioning or gone malevolent, which could possibly tie in with the idea that you've got somebody like the toy maker, plus another character above the toy maker, who the toy maker is working on behalf of, thus employing Susan Twist in some way. Maybe they've stolen a TARDIS and repurposed it. Maybe it is the meddling monk and the meddling monk is working for these people. Or maybe the character she's playing is actually the person who's above the toy maker in this sort of hierarchy of evil or whatever. Point being, and I've been speaking for ages now, and this cup of tea is definitely going cold. So I'm definitely going to hand this over at this point. Point being, it all looks like there's going to be an overarching story about somebody putting time out of joint and that somehow having something to do with the baby de- being deposited at the church on Ruby Road. John, Matt was here last week, so I'll come to you first. What do you think of all of this? Well, I, I think the, the word you're forgetting all this as well is mavity, because that's cropped up twice already. So, <laughs> But mavity is not the thing. It's an example of the yeah, thing, isn't it? But but that mavity was, that comes in that prologue from Wild Blue Yonder, 
I'm just kind of wondering if tenants kind of speech about the salt and the entities at the end of the universe might be a bit of misdirection and what we should be looking for is back in that cold open rather than in the world beyond itself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's Matt. Go oh, on. I I think there I think there I think there are two separate story arcs going on potentially and I reckon one might stretch over or three actually one might stretch over a couple of seasons one might stretch over one season I think and they all might be interlinked but there's definitely the return of the supernatural stuff mm -hmm. and I I suspect that's going to be a sort of a tone that stretches over more than one season I think there's that the could Ruby's... be the toy maker to the yeah. end of season two couldn't it yeah for when they can get Neil Patrick Harris back potentially um ready Ruby's Ruby Sunday, I think, is is this season's arc of a, a mystery, and she might be tied to one thing or the other. But I think the Mavity stuff is the indication that there is kind of something going on with time. I'm skeptical of the anagram, the S triad anagram, because we had all that with Astrid Peth and Kylie Minogue and talking about whether Kylie Minogue could be a sentient TARDIS or something. I think TARDIS is a very anagrammatical, anagrammatical. Oh um, yeah. Word. I think the point, though, at this time is that was just a character and it was just a coincidence. This time they've set up a Twitter account. They've oh, yeah, got yeah. so there's a character called Triad mm. and there's a company called yeah. Triad that's in different episodes. So whether that's being run by the same character who's spread throughout time. But Triad is definitely a bit more of a thing than Astrid. It's, it's a Torchwoody thing. It's what they did with Torchwood. Yeah, yeah. Is, 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 <laughs> who's who's going to be the mysterious Mr. Sydney Rat? Well, Torchwood, if it, on the Torchwood thing, Torchwood, <laughs> as we know, was a uh, anagram anyway, wasn't it? Yes, yes. By by coincidence, but that didn't. That, but that sort of proves my well, point. That didn't turn out to be anything actually in the series. It just. It was just what they were using to send the tapes thing. back up yeah, in yeah. first year. Yeah. I still, I still favour, I still favour the meddling monk, despite. I know, I know that it's it's along the lines of Susan's returning, the Rani's returning, blah de blah. But I think, as I say in a few weeks' time, I think the meddling monk is worthy of a return because he's different enough from yes. Master. He has the distinctive thing to do. You can get a really good actor actress playing them, and it could be whoever you like. Well, and we do would... agree on this. I just, yeah. I just don't think mm. that that's what's happening this time. Yeah, I, think I mean, it the looks like the, it's monk, the monk's yeah. force of chaos, isn't he? That's it's, yeah. he's he's not an outright villain. Anything that happens bad is generally by accident. Although he yeah. could be working under the aegis of somebody else. Yeah. which is kind of the like point. he was with the Daleks. Yeah, it's just that this looks a bit more involved than yeah. things he's done on screen before. So it's hard to tell because. Russell T Davis, when he brings somebody back, tends to do a less involved version of that character rather than a more involved version of that character. So the toy maker, the well, I guess background. I guess it's I guess it's how much you want to you want to roll Ruby Sunday into this potential time travel paradox thing. If it's just Mavity and then Beatles and then maybe a sort of a, a steadily increasing sort of playful manipulation of time and the Ruby Sunday mm. plotline is a separate thing to that, then presumably linked to um, Anita Dobson's character. So there's the whole Anita Dobson's yeah. character and that feels like a Ruby Sunday thing. So it could still be anything it, it, that doesn't feel like the monk doesn't necessarily need to be the monk at this time. At this yeah, point. I mean, it fits into me with the, the more kind of playful nature yeah. of the villains we're getting you know the toy maker you got the goblin king was it jinx monsoon with the music um and say so if you I, add the monk to that, that's perfect but isaac isaac newton is perfect and if yeah. if this character is recalling kind of medieval plain song where's the where do we first see the monk For 1066 sure, yeah. with the medieval plain song on the on the record player yeah. i should have looked at that song on wiki and found out more about it found out when it does come from yeah, so could be the monk. But I also, we have this thing, don't we, where we think that Russell T. Davis has taken a bit more notice of the Doctor Who that was made after he left the first time in his construction of Doctor Who this time. And I just wonder if this Susan Triad thing, this Susan Twist thing, is basically the sort of conference of the Doctor's wife 
which is where you get sort of the doctor in the at the TARDIS in the body of a person. And what was the other thing that's happened in Stephen Moffat's that's along those lines as well, where something to do with the TARDIS? Oh, the the cracks in time, oh, which yeah. is the TARDIS throwing the cracks in time back through time in order to draw together the sort of thing that creates the cracks in time. I just wonder if Russell T. Davis looked at the cracks in time, looked at the doctor's wife and just went, oh, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Plus, there's nothing to say Stephen Moffat hasn't been doing sort of consulting on the sly here. Well, yes. Moffat said the other day that it's two years since he came back to work on Doctor Who. And we think he's written three episodes because we think, well, boom in series one. The Christmas special in between series one and series two. And we think, I don't know if we know, but I believe we think there's an episode in series two as well. And I Mm. guess you'd kind of expect that. So if he's written three episodes, I mean, one of the suggestions that was made, I can't remember if it was by one of us or whether it was from somebody outside, but just a suggestion rather than an actual, oh, I think this is happening, was, you know, I wonder if Russell T. Davis is doing but Doctor Who, but is in more conversation with Stephen Moffat about how he did Doctor Who and to some extent, to some degree, might be using Moffat as a kind of consultant over the timey wiminess of it. And, you know, we said, or me and Dylan, I think, at least said, wouldn't that be an ideal thing to have Stephen Moffat's storytelling intertwined with Russell T. Davis's character work? And so if that is some of what's going on this year, the science fiction, the fantasy, whatever, the plor- plotting, the narrative might be a bit more thorough going than you sometimes get with RTD. But I guess we'll see. Any more thoughts before we start just going through the titles and... Yeah. All right, let's get stuck in. We've got eight titles this afternoon. Three and a half blooming hours. We had to wait for them, right? <laughs> but that's that's a good that's good marketing by the BBC. Because it I wasn't think... just three and a half hours we were waiting for. It. it was three and a half hours we were WhatsApping. Mark Donaldson was tweeting about Doctor Who all the time. Whether it was good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's just people I were think... like reacting. It gave space for that. I think it might have played better if they shrunk the time between. So maybe started with 40 minutes, then gone 35, 30, 25, 20. Because by the end of the afternoon, I noticed the conversations were drying up and people were just getting a bit, you know, impatient waiting for the last couple. I think people had had their fill of the three and a half hour wait by the time you got to about two and a half hours. I don't know. I was out for some of the afternoon, so I missed a lot of it. The first one, kind of we knew yeah and that's so space you, babies you episode. mysteriously guessed this before we had any kind of clues to the episode which suggests that there's something on gallifrey base <laughs> that you're privy, <laughs> privy to no only the no the first episode had kind of been leaked and the third oh, episode okay. had kind of been leaked and they okay. gave us the second episode so we knew what the first three episodes were i don't think okay. I, I don't think it was on gallifrey base i think they just leaked the okay. first and third okay. episodes yeah. and yeah. Stephen Moffat actually gave us his episode title yeah. himself yeah. so so we kind of knew the first three but we'll do the conversation Space Babies which is Russell T Davis obviously I'll say the name of the directors but I don't know really any of the names Julianne Robinson but Space Babies Space Station Spaceship if those sort of outer space special effects are the ones it looks nice enough we saw one of the babies talking as um, animated by Ian Levine's team who are doing Dalek's Master Plan, right? <laughs> I made that joke in private. There's no way I wasn't going to make it again on the air. I mean, what do you think? The space Babies and the little that we've seen of that, that idea, is that going to tie into the sort of Ruby Road, there's a baby on the church steps thing? Because it, it seems strange otherwise to have two episodes in a row that both have babies in. So do we think that'll happen? Possibly. I, I think I saw someone on Twitter trying, when, uh, when the last year came, they were matching the footage of the episode and I think that butterfly thing was supposedly from Space Babies. Oh, see, I saw somebody else saying it was from episode four and somebody yeah, else so again saying it was God from knows. episode five. <laughs> so God knows. <laughs> Plus, I'm sure we saw that Ruby is wearing a costume that she wears in the Beatles episode in one of the long shots. So who knows? Oh, yeah, um, it, it's 
likely to be sort of one of Russell G. Davis's usual season openers, isn't it? It's going to be fast, it's going to be funny, but quite likely to be forgettable. It's just kind of there as a tone setter just to draw people in, really, I think. Yeah, perhaps not as good as some of what follows. <clears throat> so, Matt, any more thoughts on Space Babies? What do I you mean, think of the title, Space Babies? It's... This title's fine. I, look, I think all the titles are fine because they're kind of empty. Even the bland ones are fine because they're voids. I, mean, I guess actually choosing a title is tricky for Russell T. Davis because he knows that there are people like us out there that if he if he puts an anagram into a title or any sort of hint of anything more then it'll it'll ruin it if he goes absolutely too obscure it'll be too obscure so finding a balance between the two poles yeah i mean, I mean his first episode titles tend to be quite bland yeah it's descriptive it's almost yeah. like he hasn't changed it from that you know the pitch document but his, and his last episodes, actually, his first the season openers and the season closers generally have shit titles, and there's yeah, no two the, ways. The about last it. episode's always something apocalyptic, but it's oh. always, but it's always somewhere, as I say, between. It's not too. So the Battle of Rav, Rav, Skor, Rav Kolos is an obscure title that there's no way you can make anything of unless you're like doing anagrams all the time trying to work it out. The return of the Sontaran, say would be at the other end of the spectrum where it's you know do you think Sontarans are in this returning perhaps so Russell T Davis tends to maybe maybe overthink it and pitch his right in the middle in exactly the bland kind of central zone really his titles and especially the opening and closing ones often tend to have something to do with the characters and nothing to do with the plot Okay. So you've got yeah, things like space babies, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I'm just talking about in general the first yeah. time round. So things, mm. something like Partners in Crime was to do with Tennant and Tate. Yeah, Tenet and actually, Tate. Smith and, and actually, Jones is. Yeah, Smith. yeah. Actually, Partners in Crime actually maybe does also refer to what the Adipos are up to because they've got what's the face from Coronation Street or wherever it was as a partner oh, in Lancashire. crime. Sri Lankashire. So I suppose that they. That's one that maybe did have a double meaning, but often his episode titles don't even have a single meaning, let alone a double meaning. Parting of the ways. I mean, what does that really refer to? Rose and the Ninth Doctor, parting of those ways. Well, yeah, but at the time it was written, he wasn't leaving. It was <laughs> it was literally just a slutty, oh, you'll have to watch this because what do you think is going to happen here? Well, did no, he not. retitle that, though, maybe when Eccleston I don't did know. leave? But even if it is about that, the doctor's not leaving. It's they're not actually parting. It's a weird title that doesn't really relate to anything that happens in the episode. If you think about it for even a second, and you know his opening and closing titles here, uh, Space Babies. Yeah, it's like right on the nose. It's a bit like calling partners in crime cute fat creatures or whatever. It's that on the nose but it says nothing about what the story is about no but if he can if he can turn look who's talking into a, a horror movie then you know good luck to him look who's talking meets alien yeah but it looks like if the babies are talking it looks like the babies aren't really babies and actually the threat in the little teaser thing they did with the episode titles, the threat comes from a monster that's on that ship. And actually, we've seen that monster now, haven't we? Because you can put it together yes. with the shot of the monster that we probably weren't sure where it was from before that. So actually, we've seen more of that. And so it looks like, oh, there are these creatures that look like babies but aren't being chased down by this horrible monster. Tooth and claw, except instead of kung fu monks, you've got talking babies. I watched <laughs> I'd watch that. Oh, yes, <laughs> sure. It sounds cool, so I'm going to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like fun, but it doesn't it, uh, it doesn't sound yeah. doesn't, it sounds a bit superficial. We'll see. The Devil's Court, the second one also is Russell T. Davis. I joked about it being Chris Chibnall. Sadly, that wasn't true. <laughs> I mean, Tragically. Yeah. <laughs> Directed by Ben Chessel. Um, it's the Beatles one. It's are we sure now? It's the Jinx Monsoon one. I think we're pretty yeah, much sure. Pretty, I still think. Yeah. I'm still not entirely 100 percent sure. It's absolutely confirmed, but I think we're 99.9 percent sure, aren't we? So 
and to me that looks like but so, I'm pretty sure the filming that Jinx Monsoon did was in that 60s kind of setting. Or, was it? With the yeah. stuff, it it stuff makes sense. Using. Everything we've seen indicates that it was, but I just don't think it's absolutely been confirmed. I think no, the, but point... the music thing is just yeah, too much, is, isn't this it? It feels like this yeah. is the musical, this is the jukebox musical. Yeah. This is the one where it looks like the Doctor is singing. It's probably going to be singing something like a David Bowie song or more like a Beatles song in order to bring the Beatles back from wherever they've been banished to. The fact they've cast for essentially unknowns, I think, as the Beatles suggests they're probably not going to have a particularly large part in it. So to me, that does smack of the Beatles are missing. What are we going to do about it? And so you get a little cameo. As far as I'm aware, people have looked at the... Um, bios of the four actors who have been cast and at least three of the four if not all of them are Liverpudlian actors so I mean it seems like it was much more important to make sure they went scouse on the Beatles than to get representation behind the camera in other departments are, are you queuing up Matt for an accent here <laughs> no, Hell no. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go near Liverpool that's a game <laughs> dear oh dear that was even worse I, I think it's answer. i think it's best that they don't appear that much yeah yeah, that, yeah. you know get them out of the way and then see look at that oh god it is going to be richard curtis's yesterday though isn't it they kind it. of a guffin is what i think it needs yeah i mean we've heard from somebody who's knows somebody who's seen it that this is a good one that this is a good episode so I mean, that's promising. It do, I mean, all the elements are there. It does sound, I mean, I, I don't think any of us are opposed to the idea of a musical, especially yeah. if it's a sort of diegetic, in some ways, musical. And if it's a comedy as well. So if this is more Unicorn and the Wasp than Rosa, which I assume, yeah. I assume it will be more Unicorn and the Wasp than Rosa, then I can, I can adjust my brain to, to have a comedy episode set in the 60s. At least it would have a few jokes in it, which Richard Curtis's yesterday seemed to forget about. Oh, did it? I've not seen it. Is it that bad? Yes. It, it gets worse the more I live with it in my head. Oh, wow. Fair enough. OK. But The Devil's Court, I think that looks like a great one, actually. Um, yeah. There's something else I wanted to bring up about that before we move on, but that seems to have gone out of my head, too. So, OK, let's move on. Then. Boom. Yeah. No, it wasn't that. It was uh, there was something else that was at the back of my mind that I was going to bring up, but I've, it's completely gone. Now, OK, Boom, then, is the Moffat one. We knew that it was called Boom, and he pretty much told us himself that it's called Boom. That's the other one by Julianne Robinson, who did Space Babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so that's this the, one... That's the Hugo Award winning one in this season. <sighs> Yeah, maybe. I mean, it depends. We don't know what no. Stephen Moffat's going to be doing this time around, do we? It looks like it's it looks like it's pretty much all in one setting on one set. Is, we talked is about that this, the we, one that he's stepping on the landmine? That... That's what we think. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're pretty sure of that. And the, yeah, so... the tone the tone word is Hitchcock, which makes sense of the doctor stepping on a landmine and being wow. stuck there. It looks like maybe he didn't step on it by accident, but stood on it for a reason because it's so brightly coloured. Or maybe it was that he stepped on it and then they uncovered it. And it, I don't know. Or it's invisible it's... becomes. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to try and guess assume, how that worked. But yeah. I would assume it it would be disguised to start with. And then because that's that's one of the requisite features of landmines is that you can't see them immediately. But, but it is. But the whole landmine thing. I mean, this is a futuristic wars. The whole landmine thing might not mean what we think it means anyway. Look what Moffat did with the mines at the start of um, The Magician's Apprentice. So it could entirely be something other than what we expect it to be. It looks like it looks like basically it's one set, one bunch of actors and a situation, doesn't it? So the Hitchcock thing, as we spoke about, could mean something more like rope or rear window. And there are other examples that I can't get in my head at the moment. Lifeboat. But yeah. Sorry? Lifeboat. Lifeboat, of course. Yes. Yes. So it looks like it could be more that. So do we? Ex I mean, I guess we all expect that to be our favourite for the year, given that it's Stephen Moffat. But I guess that's if, not necessarily if, the case. If, if it's one set, it's going to be some kind of high concept. So it's going to be one that's going to stand out for that reason. You know, you've got that novelty sure. look there. 
<laughs> there seems to be quite a bit of high concept among the episodes this year, though. What would happen if the Beatles got taken out of time? It's quite high concept, isn't it? it it's engaging with the popular culture since Russell T. Davis left, isn't it? Because obviously, it was like yesterday, then episode six, as we'll come to, explicitly says Bridgerton. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well yeah, we'll get to that in a few seconds. All right, the next one then. Directed by Dylan Holmes Williams, who directs the next two, four and five. Number four, again by RTD. So you've got RTD, RTD, Moffat, RTD, RTD, Kate Heron and Bryony Redman, and then RTD, RTD, Christmas, Moffat. So, and actually, just on that note, that's three quarters of the episode of the series. That is a much higher percentage than we've had in any year before this point. Wasn't really... Season one's what? Eight? Oh, if you include the Christmas only. special? Season one is eight have, episodes out of right. 13. So it's, yeah, but it's slightly less than two thirds. This is fully three quarters. Or nine out of 14 if you go Christmas special. So that No, year, I'm not including this Christmas mm, specials. I'm talking about the but yeah, series. But yeah, it's, it, but it, yeah, I think it's, I think what or the whole thing is, it's analogous to that third series. It's setting that tone, Russell do it, and then once that's set, you can bring in the other writers then. And presu- presumably the BBC and Disney and Bad Wolf Wanting, are yeah. quite happy for Russell T. Davis to just, for this not to be. And one thing I've, I miss in this series is it's not going to be a, a trying out ground for new, potentially great Doctor Who writers. But maybe Doctor Who's kind of on trial at the moment because this is the first season of a new the new version of it in so partnership, yeah. so a safe pair of hands plus russell t davis is being paid big money here by in bbc terms anyway so mm. he they're going to want scripts on him so they can sell that but from a fan perspective rtd1 was with the exception of the moffat episodes just a single voice basically almost the entire way through and this is i mean Hopefully, Kate Heron and Bryony Redmond will have a voice as distinctive as Moffat. But if not, then it just becomes the one voice with the one odd episode again here, doesn't it? Anyway. It depends, wasn't it? Well, Russell didn't script edit particularly Stephen's see Moffat's script first time out. So That's what I said. RT did one with the exception of the Moffat the, episode. Yeah. Wasn't the principle that if they'd done show running, they weren't touched quite as much? So, obviously, Bryony Redmond and Kate Heron have done show running. So... Hopefully yes. that's set, that bodes well for that one. Fingers crossed. I hope so, yeah, because it would be nice if we could get those different voices. Anyway, episode four, 73 yards, it's called. I wonder if that's a measure. I, I wonder if that's a very specific measurement of a particular thing that Russell T. Davis has in mind that we won't necessarily know. It's the political episode, isn't it? 73 oh, yards. Yeah. 73 yards could be the distance between the front door of the synod to the front door of something else or the amount of distance you have to walk to get from a particular thing to a particular something else or something. It could be the amount of ale the doctor has to drink (laughs) in order to get past the first round to get on to... Must have been a hell of a shoot for shooting there, not that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, they... followed, followed by Dot and Bubble, which is probably a description <laughs> what, of yeah. his digestive system after he's had 73 yards of ale. I mean, 73 yards, the little teaser thing they gave us on the um, Twitter was, it was pub a sign. sort of yeah. pub, pub sign. I And this is the political one, I'm pretty sure, the one that is about a political candidate that's set in the near future, 2050 or something like that, 25 years hence, something like that, I think. Is, is if, the yards a bit significant, you know, metric system versus imperial? Don't know. Well, that stinks to me of um, sort of boomer gammons trying to take time back to a time before the Victorians had stopped putting people in workhouses. I mean, uh, Thematically, that's perfect if we think the season's uh, going to be about changing time. I'll well, honest, absolutely. If you, if you take the politic, because I've forgotten about the, the political mm. edge, if you take that out of it, this feels more like Midnight set in the Winchester from Shaun of the Dead. Another sort of, because that pub sign is a pretty creepy pub sign. Sure, and fairly distinctive, and it's definitely a pub sign. And the dot There's... and double does feel a bit more. Is it, is it going to be a sequel to the demons, Matt? <laughs> pub signs. 
Well, that, I think though the point is, I'm pretty sure we've seen filming in other places for this, so it's not all set in that one location. Some of it was quite urban. So there's stuff around a campaign, as long as that is episode four rather than episode five. So there, there was the stuff around the campaign office, wasn't there? So unless that stuff was actually episode five rather than episode four, because these are both directed by the same person. Yeah. But it looked so if it is that the episode four, 73 yards, the pub site is the political one. I wonder if it becomes a story about where the candidate is from rather than where the candidate is now. And again, that fits in with that theme of, I mean, I guess the theme of the series beyond the sort of time shenanigans theme is a theme of where do we come from? Where does Ruby Sunday come from? Where do all these other characters come from? Where did the Beatles come from? Where does this political candidate Liverpool. come from? <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? The theme of the series would be origins as yeah. much as anything else. So it would kind of fits in with that. Even Space Babies, if it's about babies, those are origins of other people yet to be developed into, I guess. So I don't know. And it, it could be that I've got that wrong anyway. And the political stuff is in episode five. So let's talk about that as well at the same time. That's called Dot and Bubble. That's the one with the giant man-eating slugs in it, from what I gather. Yeah, Dot, dot and Bubble is the reference to when you're messaging someone, isn't it? It's the dots in the bubble. Because mm. that was very much the idea on the little gift they put up with it. Yeah, it looks like it's a techno thing. Yeah, a bit like um, the stuff that RTD was digging into in years and years, right? So it might be that he had this sort of Black Mirror adjacent idea while he was writing years and years and thought that would be great for Doctor Who. And did some of it that wasn't suitable in years and years and maybe left himself an idea for if he did come back to Doctor Who. Or maybe subsequently when he came back to Doctor Who, he thought. But but the point being, it looks like it's technological in some way. I think some of the filming around it has been around the idea of a company, a tech company. Maybe that's where this triad enterprises or whatever that's up on Twitter has come from. Maybe that's to do with this episode, perhaps. And yeah, it could be that the political candidate stuff is in this one, because I guess that would fit the theme too. And I guess there's also possibly a slight inkling, a hint that this could be similar to Ringu, the Japanese film, The Ring, mm. where if you get the dot and bubble thing in a particular message, then the space slug comes to get you. And so people could be afraid of getting the Partic this particular so every time they look at their phone and they see Jumps a dot on the bubble phone. it's going to be about <laughs> that'd be great it's going to be about attention so it's going to be about, about attention spans and people in the streets getting distracted by their phones all the time so russell t davis will have walked around swansea or cardiff and seen all of these young people just staring at their phones and not seeing what's going on around them and he's going to imagine big slugs coming up behind them as they're staring on the phone, getting absorbed by their phone, waiting for something to happen. And the slug gets... And then they get absorbed by the slug sucks instead. Them, sucks them off, for, <laughs> for the want of an expression. Yeah, that, that's absolutely every, every Friday evening in Cardiff, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so Ben Chessel, who did episode two, which was the Beatles one. So that one's set 50 years, 60 years ago now, actually, isn't it? So the next one he's done, the other one in his um, production block, is episode six, Rogue, which is the time agent one. Regency, so yeah. It's the Regency one. It's the one with Indira Varma in. It's yes. the one where people are changing into kind of bird creatures. And it's also the one that has a time agent from the 51st century who has an affair with a doctor in the middle of the story, by the sound of it, from from what I can gather, and they think it's not Captain Jack recast. It's it sounds very Loki though, doesn't it? I, I mean, we've all seen Loki, haven't we? It, I it's haven't. So it's, I missed oh, it. haven't you? No, it, it no. kind of had that tone. It's kind of that the Doctor being the Doctor is a kind of rogue himself in that, you know, a kind of chaos agent uh, compared to same as Loki, perhaps. So there's it's going to be. I say it's, it's going to be quite fast, quite funny. I would imagine. Well, and also the story title Rogue could refer to a rogue time agent. Oh, yeah. And he could turn out that Ian Gruff, that's what he's called, isn't it? Ian Gruff 
could be the villain of the piece. So I mean, if, if they've employed an actress called Susan Twist as a twist, then you <laughs> go for someone called Gruff <laughs> as the villain of the piece. It's nice it's, to see George. Oh, Gruff. Nice see... You're a bit Gruff, aren't you? Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I'm sure. Jonathan Gruff, isn't it? I think. Oh, is that it? Yes. There is you it go. a Welsh name? No, he's American. Oh, OK. Blimey. Oh, yeah. That's why they think. Where, where do you stand Jack on the Recast. Americans compared to the Welsh, Matt? <laughs> Third. <laughs> so um, it's nice to see the Georgian setting. That's good. And I like the, Brid- the Bridgerton is, is an obvious sort of kind of target for Doctor Who. And I don't think we've been Georgian, have we? The nearest no. to something along those lines we've had, I suppose, is Girl in the Fireplace. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that's France anyway, so it's yeah. not Georgian, but yeah. it was, and the, I think, that's the nearest. Part, that's filmed a similar location as well. So, in fact, it's the same location. I don't, don't oh, know. is it? Mm, yeah. Fair enough. Street House down in Newport, just down the road. Fits, yeah. though. That could be. So that could be. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies vibes. Yeah, so that was a disaster, though, wasn't it? I mean, it was a nice idea. I mean, the film wasn't great. But... It's got a cachet to it, hasn't it? It's, you know it. it. It was quite big at the time. Even, even if you didn't read the book, it was on the shelves. Everybody yeah, knew what it was. Yeah, yeah And it's got that kind, of, that kind of subversion because, you know, Austin, the Georgian period, is a very kind of genteel, very organised, ordered period. So throw the Doctor and some aliens in there. It's going to be more interesting than, say, the medieval period or, you know, World War Two. World War Two, you expect to find aliens somewhere in there, but George and England, it's kind of a bigger contrast. Yeah, the trailer so far seems to have been concentrating on the dance, though, which uh, clearly there's going to be a lot more to it than that. I guess it's one of those episodes that could go either way. I think I'm hoping it's going to be great. It looks like it probably should be great. But it could be one of those episodes that just doesn't quite go. It just, I don't know. I'm just getting, I'm just getting this inkling that it might be an episode that just doesn't quite go, but I hope I'm wrong. Anyway, then we've got the last two episodes, both Russell T. Davis, both in the same production block, both directed by Jamie Donahue. And the first is The Legend of Ruby Sunday. And then the second is the entirely imaginatively titled Empire of Death. I, but the impression I'm getting from this is so the teaser they gave for the legend of Ruby Sunday was a camera again, which maybe suggests that she's back in front of television cameras like she was in the church on Ruby Road with um, Davina McCall. So I wonder if the legend of Ruby Sunday is the episode in which we find out where she's from. And the point of that might be to lead into a cliffhanger where we have an entire episode set in basically the Russell T. Davis equivalent of the 1980 that Robert Holmes showed us in Pyramids of Mars. In other words, the final episode, the empire of death of the final episode could be the empire that the United Kingdom becomes if some character that wasn't supposed to die has died in the past and time has taken this different course and so you've got this post-apocalyptic place and the last episode could be in this sort of post-apocalypse or whatever kind of nightmare world where the doctor is trying to work out what it is that he needs to fix in order to get time back on track i don't know that's the impression i got from the titles and the teasers and everything else about those last two episodes but what do either of you think john any thoughts on those two well, with the camera thing, maybe are they going to say pick it up with again back to that Davina McCall show? But hmm. if maybe they find the suddenly find the DNA, that would be an yeah, that was my it. thought. Yeah, and that I, I, and that DNA could be what sends them on this course that unravels time. And if if it's the legend of, are we going to get a kind of a story to, narrated, maybe told from a future point of view? Possibly. The other meaning of legend, of course, is a constructed character, like a spy would have a legend. So there's possibly also, I mean, if Russell T. Davis is doing titles with two meanings, it could also be that Ruby Sunday is a, in some ways, a constructed character. Yeah, quite possible. Well, if we remember the first use, Paul Abbott had the idea about Rose being a character constructed for the Doctor is 
is Russell T Davis reusing that idea for Ruby Sunday? Yeah, if he is, it strikes me that Russell T Davis is not the kind of writer who leaves a character in that sort of situation where there's sort of there's something ersatz about them. I think Russell T yeah. Davis is the kind of writer who would have that as a version of Ruby Sunday that's not the real Ruby Sunday, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I think he has to give us the emotional resonance. Yeah. yeah, but it could be that episode seven suddenly says, no, Ruby Sunday's not a real person. And episode eight is where the Doctor re-ravels time so that she is a real person after all. Or discovers, I mean. or discovers that even... So one thing Russell T. Davis has done is he's watched the Timeless Children storyline unfold. Yeah, yeah. So it might, it might, he wouldn't leave Ruby, he wouldn't discover that Ruby Sunday is Ursat and then think, well, she doesn't matter, dissolve her and no, then no. move on to the next one. But discover that she's Ursat, demonstrate to her that it doesn't matter if she's Ursat, it's what she does and who she is is the important thing. And then basically mm. gives her the life that she she continues to have. So it's not necessarily unravelling that or changing it, it's just making it clear that it doesn't yeah. matter what your past is I mean, what that I mean, is is who you've been adopted by and what you've become since let, let's not forget it's a russell t davis season so what we know that final episode is going to hinge around a crisis point in the relationship yeah also oh, unit, sure, yeah. Like, unit has to be in here somewhere or is that the political possible? no i i, I believe I it is that last end. episode okay. yeah so it's that, going to be it's going to be partly you know, there's going to be post-apocalyptic potentially, but there's going to be shiny, bright London unit. For sure. Oh, when yeah. I said post-apocalypse, I didn't mean in the sense of survivors or whatever. I just meant in the sense of something's happened that's put us in yeah. like an alternate timeline or something. Some kind of, some event needs to, I, I get the impression that there is an event that needs to be sort of undone, as it were. And the doctor has to make a choice between that and Ruby Sunday. Well, a bit like it's not a million miles away from series three, is it? Where oh, exactly. that ended with the master taking over the earth and that, that had to be undone. And that became a parallel timeline that didn't really exist anymore, didn't it? I get the impression that's where he's going with this, frankly. In fact, you've even got in the middle of the series, you've even got this one about a political candidate, right? That screams Harold Saxon mm. anyway, doesn't it? We'll see. <laughs> It's worth pointing out as well. People have been talking about how it's rude to Millie Gibson that she only gets one proper year, one season that's about her. And then there's another companion coming in for the second series. But Russell T. Davis has always been absolutely steadfast about you introduce a new regular character at the start of each series. So he's done that with David Tennant, then with... Um, Martha Jones Freem with Freeman Freem Regimen. Yeah. And then, although Catherine Tate had been in an episode, that's essentially what he was doing, Catherine Tate too, giving her a series. Yeah, he, he needs a story to tell with the characters. It's how how do you, you don't tell the same story twice. You know, he, it's almost like he can have that constantly running soap. If you're just about the same two characters, different relationship every single time. He's not interested in telling that same story of the same two people twice on the trot. So this is Millie Gibson's season and this story and her character essentially stops here. She will be back. We know that she's coming back. Maybe for the spin-off, who knows? Uh, but the point is, this is her story. And then she steps aside for somebody else to have their story, which she might form some part of. But that's how it looks like it's going to yeah. work. I'm, I'm even when... Obviously, Eccleston wasn't supposed to be leaving. I think the state, the plan was for Billy to leave halfway through the season originally on that one. So there was going to be a change during the season. I think yeah, she was due sure. to leave around the time of this Sidemen two-parter. Oh, head. really? Yeah. Oh, then probably her leave at the Sidemen two-parter and come back at the end yeah. at the resolution of the storyline in the way that Mickey did in the end. So, that would make sense. Yeah. Look, Looks like that could be something along those lines is what happens in second series because it looks like Millie Gibson is back for some of it or even if it's just that she's coming back for the spin-off who knows 
I think we're done then. I, th I think that's about it. Unless either of you two's got anything more that you want to bring up. John, have you any thoughts about the trailers that you've not been able to talk about? Um, obviously we did that. The dinosaurs, for example. I know oh, we yeah. talk, mentioned it briefly. Well, uh, who doesn't love dinosaurs? <laughs> you know, it, it's, you, you put them in, they're a, they're a big draw. You know, it, it, it's almost a, as, as Moff would have it, a tarty thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You, you just got, got that in there, um, and you got obviously the companion with a slightly changed face. Um, no, they just they're kind of they're selling it on Shooty's energy. They're signing it on this kind of chaos. It's it's got that balance between light end and science fiction without being off putting to the perhaps the international audience that might it's just got the, to Disney Plus. It's got something of the tone that those early Marvel movies had. Yes, hasn't it? I, I think that's what they're going for, that big family. Big brio, yeah. but at the same time, not afraid to be contemplative. Contemplative? Contemplative. Yeah. When... Contemplative. 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 <laughs> None contemplative. Of us say it. <laughs> when required. So that yeah. was, I always thought that was one problem with RTD1, is that it was either first gear or fourth gear, but there was never second or third. It just swung violently swung from one thing to another but Shuji Gatwa he has the brio but he looks like he's got the range to yeah. take it up through the gears it's, rather than just screaming from one thing to the next it's it's very difficult to play the emotional beats on Russell Dave's D Dave script because they are so fast I mean I rewatched Rose again on you know on the data transmission and it's so fast there's no time it doesn't stop to consider it and it's very, very difficult to go from that 100 miles an hour to the slow thing. Uh, David Tennant doesn't nail it in his first season. And he does as he it goes along. It all. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think, but I think it also it does come out of the writing. And yes. Totally. I don't know. I'm hoping. So we don't know. Uh, some people are expecting these to be 60 minute episodes because there's only eight of them. I'm not expecting that. No, but I, we don't I, know I if they're standard. Yeah, it, but it could be that they're sort of 50 rather than 45. I mean, the Russell T. Davis it's, ones are always all over the place anyway. But if there's just that little bit more time in these it's, it's episodes... On a, it's streaming, isn't it? So there's no need to say, to cut it for a standard US hour of TV. Well, it's or anything. broadcasting over here, so yeah, I'm assuming it has to fit in somehow. But the Saturday schedule's always been just ever so slightly looser anyway. Hasn't yeah. it? Most you, can, you so. can move five or ten minutes around quite easily. Generally speaking, any more thoughts, Matt? I'm quite looking forward to it. So I think the Russell. I'm disappointed that there are there isn't a variety of writers because, as I've said, that normally you get the highs of of discovering new writers, or you get a gated script, so you know what you're getting with a gated script. But you know what you're getting with Russell T. Davis. So there's guaranteed consistency, pretty much. Whether that's you know, yeah, high, exciting consistency, or just oh, thank goodness, we're not going to, we're unlikely to get a duff episode. By all reports, the Christmas special was challenging in in the way it was made. Um, but actually, for me on screen, I only noticed that when when I came on the podcast and people started pointing out that most of it was set in the flat and and there were bits <laughs> weird going on. Actually, watching it, I thought. Oh, thank goodness there are jokes here and and the jokes are landing and I'm finding it witty and it's paced mm. well and I think yeah that's that's reassuring all right we'll leave it there then we'll probably be back in a, about a week's time to do another one of these news things <laughs> no doubt I, I suppose a word I suppose we're coming up towards broadcast I might as well just do a very quick thing what we're going to be planning to do on the podcast when that happens because of the friday night thing it means we all get chance to see the episodes by saturday afternoon so i guess what i'll probably do because our episodes have been going out monday wednesday friday as of late and in that mix there's been one doctor who episode we've over recorded doctor who content so between now and the start of the series i think there's a good chance two of those three episodes will be doctor who based most of the weeks between now and then and then when it does come to broadcast, instead of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I think we're probably going to be Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. So the review episodes will probably go out on video on Saturday evening and on audio on Sunday morning. 
because the audio takes a bit longer to edit because I usually chuck the videos straight out. So generally speaking, we're, we're probably planning to get together at about 4 p.m. on a Saturday. And so the video will probably go out early Saturday evening and then the audio, like I say, Sunday morning. And so there'd just be a slight change to the schedule. Right, until we get together again, I was JR. I was Matt. And I was John. And we will speak again soon.